So this is starting out on uh, the subsection three uh, list columns. In the last video, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the Gapminder package and then manipulating uh, data frames, uh, index, et cetera, within that context. Starting with this section three, we're going to start breaking down some of those previous uh, discussed topics. So chapter, uh, sorry, section three, subsection three is list columns. List columns are implicit in the definition of the data frame. A data frame is a name list of equal length vectors. Again, this is just uh, using vocabulary to specify that everything in our studio is vectors and that a data frame is just a uh, list of those vectors. And then going into this particular chapter 25, uh, how you nest those vectors together. Uh, base R doesn't make it easy to create list columns and the data dot frame treats a list as a list of columns. So if we were to compare and the code base that we're using here is data dot frame, we're creating a list uh, variable X and then populating it uh, with the, the numbers one through three and then the second column being the numbers three through five. When we print that data frame, you can see that the first column is numbers one, two, and three. And then the second column starts over with three, four, and five. We're going to find that this example is repeated multiple times, but then it changes into the form in which it's presenting it. Okay. You can prevent data.frame from treating a list of lists by adding the I attribute to the argument. Uh, however, this doesn't print very well. So what I'm, excuse me, jumping ahead here. I'm trying to scroll down with my mouse. There we go. All right, get out of that little area there. Um, the I stands for inhibit interpretive uh, conversation of objects. So what we're doing is changing the class of an object to indicate that it should be treated as is. In the second example, we have data.frame. We're populating it with that variable X um, using the I argument uh, lists one through three and three through five. In the next column, we have column Y. And here uh, we're using a different call, but uh, what I want the team to focus on is where those quotation marks are placed in this list. So the populated values one and two, and then the second is going to be three and four and five. When we look at the second example here, we notice that column X is populated with one, two, and three. The second row of column X is going to be uh, three, four, and five. Looking at column Y, it's one and two, and then the second row of column Y is three, four, five. If we use a tibble, it uh, alleviates the problem by being lazier. A tibble doesn't modify its inputs and by providing a better print output. Note where the quotations are. I'm repeating myself in that statement. So in the tibble call, it's a derivative of data frame or just different vector type. Um, but X list is one through three, and then the second column would be three through, uh, three through five. And then we have a second Y column with values one and two, and then the second column with three, or second row with three, four, and five. Uh, so again, here the use of a tibble is showing that uh, the X column is going to be a list, whereas the Y column are characters. Um, we have rows number one uh, populated with one and two, and then the second row populated with three, four, and five. Actually, I said that wrong, John. Uh, integer is row X is a list of three, and then row two of column X is an integer of three, whereas row Y is actually showing you the characters one and two, and then the second row three, four, and five. If we use a triple, it can automatically work out that you need a list. So here, this particular um, syntax is we're creating the same column or format uh, with column X and column Y. The first row of column X is going to be uh, one through three, uh, whereas the uh, column Y would be values one and two. Again, the quotations are creating that character, whereas the uh, column X is gonna be the integer or a list, I guess. Looking at the output of that particular syntax, again, it repeats from what the, the previous uh, example had. Okay, These are both the same values. We're just using a slightly different syntax to create that same output. 
List columns are often most useful as intermediate data structures. Advanced uh, advantages of keeping related items together in a data frame is worth a little hassle. Uh, that was a note of the author that made that comment of stating kind of the tidy models mindset uh, or a tidy verse mindset, tidy data. Um, being able to, to change it, manipulate it, and modify it is going to be worth that little bit of hassle because later on, as we start to uh, become more advanced or, or do the calculations with those data frames, it will help you in the long run. I think um, at some point in, yes, uh, within the last month or two, I had talked about um, the that the tidyverse is an opinionated framework, and this is a really good example of what that means. Is he has the opinion that the advantage of keeping related items together in a data frame is worth a little hassle, and so that is built into the tidyverse that he he thinks that's worthwhile, so he makes it possible. There was, um, I think, in the last couple of days, John, there was a couple of Twitter posts of. Our studio users, data science individuals, uh, or in the discipline of data science, that were making this uh, similar argument. Um, the difference of the opinionated styling of of manipulating base R versus tidy tidyverse. Yeah, that, I mean that is basically why the tidyverse exists. Is that Hadley and you know a lot of people he works with have um, or think that there are certain ways that things should be done, and so they built a series of packages that work with that rather than base R kind of tries to leave everything fairly open. Like there are a few opinions built in, but not that much. It's like, yeah, do, do what you want. Um, and then the tidyverse tries to put a framework on top of that. So well, in, in that thought, the, the concept of the, com the comment of the base R and, and kind of leaving you up to your own demise, or that's probably a bad way to say it, but um, <laughs> you've got to really be mindful of how your data is being managed in the background versus in the tidyverse concept. It's all, uh, well, opinionated. It's, it's, it's being managed uh, for you. Uh, it, it attempts to make things simpler for you. To a degree, at least. Yes. To a degree. Yeah. Uh, there are three parts uh, in an effective list pipeline. Uh, the first one is you create the list column using either the nest summarize plus list or the manipulate plus map, <clears throat> a map function. Uh, you can also create other intermediate lists by transforming existing list columns with either the map, map2, or the pmap functions. Or you can simply list uh, list column back down to a data frame or an atomic vector. So the, the, the thoughts here, these three points, are uh, recommendations uh, or, or different ways in, in which you can, you can manage some of this information. Okay. Next topic. Now we're going to be creating the list columns. This is section four. Topically, you won't, uh, typically, you won't create a list column with a tibble. Instead, you'll create them from a regular column using one of the three methods. First one being either tidy R and the nest function to convert a grouped data frame into a nested data frame. Uh, you can use option two, which is the mutate function, and that's vectorizing functions that return a list. Or you can summarize uh, and the summary functions that return multiple results. Alternatively, you might create Quick question. Them. Go ahead, sir. Or, um, go ahead, ma'am. Uh, grouped data frame is just the regular data frame, right? Uh, I believe in the context of that statement, it would be that nesting function that we were discussing with the Gapminder concept. So your, your data frame is now a nested data frame. It's a, well, it's a, go ahead, sorry. What he means right here is if you had, you know, um, empty cars and group, group by number of so cylinders oh okay and yeah. then you nest things into those groups Got so, it. yeah you're creating that list of list concept uh, yeah. it's it's data within data and so you yeah you're collapsing part of the data frame down into one row for the group is the Got general it. idea okay. yeah thank you when creating the list columns make sure that they are homogenous uh, the statement with homogenous implies that it is all of the same length um, if you had combining two different or grouping two different data frames together or uh, column or data together, uh, you will often run into the fact that the list is, or the numbered values within that list don't match. Uh, and so there's other ways that you can uh, uh, mitigate that as well. Um, sometimes you can put NAs or zeros. I wouldn't recommend putting zeros there. But um, anyway, the comment of homogenous implies that it's, it's of the same length. 
With nesting, uh, we create, excuse me, too far. Uh, we create a nested data frame, meaning each row is a meta observation. And again, this reiterates the thought process of lists inside of lists. Uh, when applied to a group data frame, nest keeps the grouping column as is. So we go back to the Gapminder thought process and we used the group by country and continent. When we nest that together, what we end up seeing would be uh, the first column of country in alphabetical order, the uh, FCT, 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 uh, the continent being uh, the grouping of that particular country inside that continent, and then any other metadata uh, listed with it. And that's where the 12 by 4 comes in. So we have FCT data. is uh, factor. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's lists inside of lists. You can also use it on an ungrouped data frame, uh, specifying which columns you want to nest. Uh, in Gapminder, uh, we can nest data and uh, concatenate year and uh, GDP per capita. Uh, so our output would be, uh, again, that same alphabetical list of country uh, grouped by the continent and then any of that metadata that goes along with it, or meta observations as listed. From vectorized functions, if you use the string R, uh, package and the string split and then add mutate to that, you get a list of columns. Uh, again, we're noting where those quotes are placed. So the uh, triple com set, we're creating a data frame, we're passing in uh, the variable x1 with values a, b, c, and then the second being d, e, f, and g. When you mutate uh, that same output um, using the string split, what we end up receiving is column X1 being the characters A, B, C, D, E, F, and G as row number two. And then the X2 column, uh, because they're grouped together, you're getting that list of characters. Three characters, A, B, C, and then the second row being uh, D, E, F, and G as a list of those four characters. And just to, you know, to be a little bit more precise, it's a character vector of character those. Vector. Um, of those characters. When, uh, would, would if it's okay for asking, would list and vector be uh, similar in vocabulary terms to it, the context of this? Vocabulary wise, yes, but you wanna okay. be careful because that, you know, list has a specific meaning in R. Um, I, I find myself, like if I'm writing documentation for a package or something, I find I catch myself often saying, you know, it returns a list of, well, okay, no, a character vector of blah, blah, blah. Because um, really that X2 column is a list of two character vectors. Um, I find, John, that whenever I, I read the term vector, I always remember in just mathematics, a yeah. vector is, is a straight line. Well, um, so I, I, I constantly, in the back of my mind, always try to separate the difference between what it, what it is I'm implying. Yeah, it, it is, it's complicated because, you know, a vector is like a, it's kind of like a list of numbers in math, as well as being a straight, a line with direction, you know, like the physics vector. Anyway, the term in R is, yeah, a list of character vectors this is what we have here. Good. Um, I can change that, uh, or I can add a note there if you'd like for the- uh, I, th I think it's fine. Motion. I think it's just the way that you're saying it out loud so okay. it has been the only issue. Okay, I think. very good. Um, if we unnest, uh, we know how to handle these list of vectors. So we're taking that data frame, piping it to the mutate function, um, doing a spring, uh, string split. Uh, and now when we list out, we can see that in column one, it's all ABC, 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 DEFG, DEFG. In column two, it now becomes one attribute within that um, point. And I think that highlights, uh, John, the statement of why we want to have it as a list of characters, correct? Yes. If you find yourself using the pattern a lot, make sure to check out the tidy R separate rows, which is a wrapper around this common pattern. I didn't do a lot of research into that. 
uh, statement, but it was uh, implied in the book. Uh, so I felt important to <laughs> add that uh, text here as well. Another example uses the map, map2, and the pmap functions. Uh, we could rewrite invoking different functions and rewrite it using mutate. This is a hyperlink that takes us back to another section of the document. Uh, earlier, uh, we've covered this in previous uh, discussions. What I did have difficulty with, and I made a note to myself or to the group, that I pulled in that previous chunk, and I think it was chapter 23, if I'm not mistaken. I pulled in this section of code block, and then we re, uh, re rewrite it using the mutate function. But if I can continue scrolling for a moment, I said, I don't understand what's being expressed here. The two code snippets are identical between the chapter, I think 23 and 25, uh, we're implying the same thing. It, it literally is a copy and paste. The only difference I could find syntactically was we use the word sims instead of sim. So I don't know, John, what the author was implying with these two differences here um, using that mutate function because it was called in the chapter 23 as well. At least I think it was 23. I, I forgot he did that here because again, invoke map is um, uh, deprecated. Like that's not the way you would want to do this anymore. I see. Um, let me run this code and just... I, I don't I think he just was reusing some code like yeah. I don't think it's supposed to um let's see is there any difference that we should care about that we're, I'm not seeing the outputs between the two I guess is why I was trying to make a pause here and ask what exactly are we getting at what it's, what what was implied here I think he's just pointing this out that this is a thing that creates list columns that you know we've seen before now doing it with invoke map again um it's keeping in mind fine, but it's retired like yes this, this function is eventually going to go away um it's a fan it's like doing a cra crazy kind of thing because you're invoking different functions with this invoke map see. it's see. saying what what function do you want to call and that's not something you often have to do is call a list of different functions. Okay. Um, although I do have some cases where I do this sort of thing, but it, there are other ways to do it. Um, but the just the important thing to look at is um, you're making a uh, uh, like series of outputs from that list column using the function and the output that you get is a list. It's overcomplicated, and I should have. If I could throw a way to simplify it, but well, if I could throw something in here, um, in computer science or or other languages, other scripting languages, this would be a nested for loop, correct? Where we're we're putting additional uh, iterations inside a single iteration. Is that similar to the, the map function, pmap and, and map2? That's all kind of doing that same concept, correct? Where you've got a for loop inside a for loop, you're iterating with one, you're iterating yeah. with the second one. But yeah, uh, um, and it kind of obfuscates the, the point. So let me right. let me see if I can come up with something real quick. Okay, I'll keep, um, I'll keep going to the next section. That's yeah. where that stopped at, so, or, or finished that section. Um, when we go into multi-valued summaries, one restriction of a summarize is it only works with a summary of functions that return a single value, implying you can't use it for functions like quantile that return a vector of arbitrary length. So our code snippet says we're using the empty cars package, uh, we're grouping by cylinder, and then piping that over to summarize with the quantile of miles per gallon. The summarize uh, output shows the first column being the cylinder and then grouping that with the uh, quantile value. Um, trying to recall exactly mathematically what that implies, but the method in which that call was uh, produced. You can, however, wrap the results in a list. This obeys the contract of summarize uh, because it, each summary is now a list of vector one. So changing it slightly, 
we see that group by cylinder piping it to summarize. Now we get a cylinder of 16. So we're grouping all of the MT car uh, data points with the value 16 of cylinder all together. And then we get a double output of five, uh, double five. Um, is that five for each one? If we go cylinder, no, there's only four there. No, there is five, sorry use my math correctly. So we've got five values all grouped under cylinder 16. If we go to cylinder 24, we're gonna have five values under that as well. And then finally 32. So here we've got 16 with those groups underneath, uh, 24 with those values and then 32 with those values. To make useful results with unnest uh, I don't think that's supposed to be there. That's supposed to be a parentheses. Uh, to make results with unnest, you can also, uh, you'll also need to capture possibilities. I've got a bunch of typos in here. I'm sorry, team. Uh, so we, we're passing, or we're creating a <clears throat> data frame of probs, uh, probabilities, uh, 0, 1, uh, 0, 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 0.99 using the empty cars package or, or data frame, piping it to group by cylinder, piping it to summarize, using that list of probabilities, and then quantile list uh, of quantile miles per gallon and probability uh, probs, uh, and then unnesting the columns P and Q. And that's what we just created here, uh, those unnesting functions. Okay. So what we're doing is, excuse me, we are showing column P at, with those probabilities, and then the quantiles listed again by unnesting it. I hope I'm, I'm making sense for everyone to com comprehend this nesting and unnesting function. Uh, so you're creating the list of lists, and then you're br uh, breaking it back apart and then showing it um, to uh, outputting it to the screen. Wait, before we go on to the next part, I, I was off um, putting together a little demo of um, kind of getting rid of the invoke map, simplifying things a little bit. So I hope this is going to be kind of readable in the chat. Okay. Let's see. All right. So I took his idea. I took what he started with, basically. But let's say we're not going to use different functions for each row. We're going to use the same function for each row. But he's setting up a, a or we're setting up a, a a list of um, what are the inputs. And actually, if I had done this a little neater, I would have just had a min column and a max column. There's no reason to start with a list column. Um, sorry about the dogs. Um, but anyway, so we've got this input. And um, the use per is the way that he's showing in the book. Basically, we were, we're just mutating across using map to take all that input and run it through the um, uniform random number function, our unit. Um, so that's all, like that's all that showing. That's the same basically as the invoke map, except he did three different functions with invoke map for whatever reason. Um, and it shows that, uh, and uh, let's see if we like print that. Um, let me copy paste this print print map or print the the output and it's just a couple it's two lists so the params is a list and the sims are a list and it automatically makes the the column where everything's still grouped together into the row you know the rows have a relationship what i added there is as of uh i don't know D, that might have been dplyr uh 1.0.0 where they embrace yeah 1.0 embraced this row wise function which had been kind of a oh here's a different way of doing things that was in dplyr and they said you know what a lot of times that's exactly what you want to do is think of your data one row at a time like force dplyr to just focus on it one row at a time and then you don't need per now it's not simpler necessarily like if you look at my code i've got this row wise and then i've got to mutate and i have to tell it that it's going to be a list and then at the end i have to ungroup um but if you're doing a lot of things it can be simpler than per 
And so this is kind of the modern way of doing, you know, I mean, both of them work, obviously. I just ran both of them and it comes out identical. I did, I should have printed um, the output of identical use per and use real wise is true, um, but they are identical. I confused myself by not setting the seed at first. And I was like, oh, right, I'm generating different random numbers. So it wasn't identical. But once I'm generating the same, same random numbers, it's identical. Those are just two ways of doing the same thing. And they're both like row wise is kind of the embrace the list column concept uh, for everything I'm going to do until I say ungroup. You, okay, so quick question, John. This is a good, great topic. I find dplyr has a lot of SQL undertones. Uh, there's many, many, many references that I've read about this dplyr package in tidyverse or, or dplyr by itself. And the concepts or the use of that service in a more database management database select where from, you know, linkage. Um, is that accurate with the thought process that we're indicating with this topic? Uh, the nesting of nesting concepts of unnest, nest, mutate, map, etc. Um, I have a I have a sneaking suspicion somewhat, in the back of my mind. Yeah. Like I, I think dplyr does a better job at dealing with the concept of a nested yeah. uh, column than um, SQL does or SQL. Well, um, no, what I'm, I guess what I'm driving for is that in a re relational database, you don't really have columns and rows. It's not, right. it's not a two-dimensional XY coordinate type system. It's kind of three-dimensional, four-dimensional, five-dimensional. It's how you, how you model or link things together. Your schema links right. things together. The yes. idea behind the dplyr thought process or this, this concept of nesting and nesting uh, code example that you're providing, it, it reinforces that thought process that you're not in an XY coordinate system. It can come from anywhere. Um, the I mean, being right. Things. You're not. And yet, like, overall, you still do have rows and columns, okay. like, but the columns, each cell can itself have rows and columns is the idea of the list column or, you know, with a list, it can be anything because lists don't have to be data frames. They can be yeah. any structure. Um, Correct. So yes, to a degree, but I think like it is, it is a hard concept to wrap your head around. Mm -hmm. um, but if you just look at it as the whole idea of it is if the stuff, you want the stuff in a row to go together. And sometimes the stuff that goes together isn't a single value, it's a list of values, or it's a table of values, or it's, you know, an image, whatever, you could have anything in these columns. The idea is the whole, that row, um, like the examples that he, when he's using the Gapminder um, data, that makes it much more clear that the row is the country, and anything that's about that country is in that row, even if it's like the population of that country over time. It's still just one row has all of the data over time. Well, and I, I know I'm deterring the team uh, or the um, I'm taking advantage or being uh, uh, what's the word <laughs> when you're selfish uh, with the time being the presenter. But um, as we go forward into this subject in other books in maximizing API calls to other web servers or just data servers, you're going to get JSON files. And these JSON files are nested nests. Uh, yeah. and in fact, it, it can get really, really complicated as you're destructuring these uh, uh, this information flow into your into your computer. So writing a script, comprehending the nature or the the uh, structure of that uh, textual file, it's just text, but the uh, attributes of that API call, linking things together. I don't know. maybe i'm I'm having an epiphany at the moment. I apologize for. Um, drawing away from the yeah. subject. Yeah, no problem. It um, makes sense. But yes, that's that is related. Uh, yeah, JSON is tends to be very deeply nested. That's another yes. um, data structure. But the nice thing is, you know, nested tibbles allow you to translate back and forth between this Great. web sort of data structure and efficiency data structure. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Sir. All right. Um, all right. So from name lists, uh, uh, what you, uh, what do you do if you uh, want? Sorry. Go ahead for sorry, can, I, can I ask a question? 
to, to John in particular. Uh, I need to ungroup anytime I do row wise. So, um, um, so it's a good habit too, because really what row wise is doing is creating a group for each row. And so if you don't ungroup those, those row, you know, it's still in row wise mode. Um, uh -huh. It doesn't break anything to just, if, if you're done, like if that's the end of what you're doing, it'll just say row wise at the top. It's not a big deal, but it's a good habit whenever you, whenever you're done with a set of groups, include the ungroup explicitly because otherwise later you'll do something to the data frame and you're like trying to do a summary across the whole data frame and you find out, oh, whoops, I'm just getting it row wise still because it's still in row wise mode. So, uh -huh. okay. um, and then also sometimes you'll do things, um, I can't think of a good example right now, but like even just printing a row wise data frame takes a tiny bit longer than printing it when it when it's not row wise. So it's good to ungroup just to get rid of that extra overhead that you don't care about the rows row wise aspect of it anymore. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Great question. Uh, the <clears throat> make all data frames with one column containing the elements and another column containing the list. So you can use a tibble and end frame. So X list uh, A one through five, B three through four, C through five through six. And then when we call the end frame X uh, and uh, print out the data frame, what we're going to see is the character lists A, B, C and, and the first name column. And then the values being a list of lists, uh, integer list, um, each one having integer five, integer two, integer two. And if we go back up to this, this concept, looking at it mathematically, or sorry, looking at it from a, from a uh, numeric value, um, we have five values uh, set for uh, A, uh, three, uh, sorry, two values for B, and then two values for C. And that's how we get this 522 thought process. Now, if you want to iterate over the names and values in parallel, we can use the map to function. Uh, and so here we're taking our data frame that we just created, piping it to mutate, uh, and then adding the summary map to character uh, name value, and then iterate with uh, string.x. Uh, in the middle is a, is a colon. And then uh, with the uh, 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 I'm losing my thoughts here the dot notation of in the background of your computer. Uh, so the dot notation is a more efficient way of allocating or, or accessing memory uh, in your, in your uh, computer. Well, and specifically that's a, a, it's the map to formula syntax. So when you put the little, when you put the tilde before string R. Okay. Um, you're saying, I wanna use this syntax where dot X means my first argument and dot Y means my second argument. For the map too. So the output that we would have would be the name ABC, just like we had above uh, the values of a list five, uh, five integers, uh, two integers and two integers. And then on the summary output, um, the uh, numeric value. I'm not, I'm going to pause or, or continue on because I'm not able to answer the one, three, and five. That's because you're you're grabbing the first element of dot y. Okay. And so the first element of value for the first row is one. The first element of value for the second row is three. Right. Let's scroll back up to make sure I'm not um, yep. saying this wrong. That yeah. So that's the one three five is the ABC or the start. You know the first value within each. Ah. Okay. That makes one. sense. The the beginning, and the beginning. So if you change, yeah, if you change that number to two, it would be mm -hmm. two, four, six, because that's the second number of each one. And if you change it to three, it would break because uh, B and C don't have a third value. Yep, that makes sense. Excellent. Okay, next section is simplifying list columns. Uh, I'm looking at the clock with 15 minutes left. Um, to simplify the list column back to a regular column or an atomic vector uh, or a set of columns, the first is if you want a single value, you use mutate uh, with map uh, long, I think, LGL, uh, map integer 
logical. Uh, map logical, map integer, and map double, or map character to create the atomic vector. The second option would be if you want to, uh, if you want many values, use the unnest function, and this converts the list column back to regular columns, repeating the rows as many times as necessary. Um, so we have our list vector. You can always summarize an object with its type or length so that the code will uh, work regardless of what sort or list columns you have. Uh, data frame with triple. Um, the passing the letters uh, one through five or characters one through five uh, and then one through three. And then if we run that, uh, run if, uh, That's run if is a logic. R unif. It's not run if. Oh, it's R unif. I'm sorry. That means it's a um, uniform random number. So it's where you have an equal chance all the way across the range versus um, R norm is where you have, you know it, it is creating a bell curve. Um, that is like the most, like it's the most unfortunate function name because it looks like run if and run if sounds like a thing that would be in a program. I was right? thinking like logical check, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But no, it uh, means, good. So uh, it's it, it's actually separated run uniform. Yes. And really it should just be like uniform. I don't know. Oh, R is for random, but yeah. Random uniform. Um, yeah. Uh, I feel I'm, I'm missing <laughs> out on uh, not doing enough research during the uh, <laughs> development of the presentation with uh, uh, learning more of these function calls. Uh, the, uh, what we get on this output of type uh, map character and length map integer is column X is a list 535 uh, type is going to uh, tell us what class the uh, variable would be in and then the integer would be the length of that value. Although being the same basic information you get from the default table print method, you can now use it for filtering. Don't forget about the map X shortcuts. So what we're referencing here is if you start to type in your uh, control uh, map, and then you'll get your sub list of what choices you have for that particular function. So you can use uh, map character with X and then uh, Apple to extract the string stored in Apple for each element of X. Uh, Using the dot null argument, it uh, provides a value uh, to use if the element is missing instead of returning a null attribute. Uh, data frame triple, uh, we're having list A1 and B equals two. List, uh, or the second list is going to be A equals two and then C equals four. Mutating and then mapping with double uh, on each point A and B, what we end up getting is a list of values two uh, the double is one and two, and then the column B is two and NA because that didn't exist. Okay. Unnesting works by repeating the regular columns once for each element of the list column. Here we're uh, creating the tibble uh, X of one through two, Y is list one through four with number one included, and then also we unnest Y. So the output during this uh, code would be column X with rows uh, 11111 and then two, and then column Y would be the uh, double values, uh, one, two, three, four, and then finally adding that one at the end. Uh, the concept, or I thought uh, when I was reading this, the thought was that it's maintaining that, uh, what was the comment earlier in the text? Uh, they have to be homogenous, the list rows have to be homogenous. So it's a placeholder, correct? We're repeating 11111 in the front because column Y yeah. has the iteration. I threw the tibble uh, before the pipe into unnest, okay. into the chat, because that's helpful to understand what we're doing here is the input is a two row tibble. It has uh, X equals one, X equals two, and then Y is the vector one through four and the vector one, just the value one. So if you look at look at the um, the output there, yeah, it's a two by two tibble with uh, y is a list column. So then when you say unnest y, that's where you get the repeats of the a value because a has four values associated with it. Or sorry, one. Not I said a, but x 
um, the value one has four values associated with it. The value two has one value associated with it. All clear? Okay. You cannot sim you. simultaneously. You cannot simultaneously unnest two columns that contain different numbers of elements. Uh, and this is text from the from the document uh, or from the uh, book uh, because Y and Z have the same number of elements in every row so that the data frame triple uh, X and Y and then we're adding Z uh, one is uh, sorry the number one uh, characters A and B and then the numeric vector one and two or one through two uh, with the second being the two uh, the character C and then just the value of three um, on the output end, we would have the uh, column X is one and two, column Y would be uh, the characters two and then the character one because we just have C up here. And then the second list column Z is gonna be integer uh, numeric vector two and then double single character vector one. John, make sure I apologize for pausing I realize my vocabulary is not correct. So by stating the method in which I just conveyed, is that accurate? The um, so yes. Numerals. Okay. So one thing I um this this actually does work now. Um when he's about to show us that the tibble two df2 doesn't work to unnest, df1 does work to unnest. They actually they added the the logic in that he's about to explain, but here's what you would have to do instead. And he's like, you know what? You always have to do that thing instead. So they just built it into the function. Um, so, you know, logically what it's saying is it's going to create new rows for the the missing values and, or, or for the, to, to spread things out. And Y and Z in this case are the same length. So um, one gets two new rows. When X equals one, you get two new rows. When X equals two, you get one new row. Just looking at, you know what we've got here and go ahead and scroll down and that's what we'll see. Bit. Yep. And then he does the other two and y has one and then two values, z has two and then one values. And so it's like, oh that doesn't make sense. And, and if we scroll down um and try to unnest actually okay see it does work. <laughs> like it just it figures out the combinatorial like it's it what it does is it unnests and then it unnests again. So in this case, what we what we're seeing in this first column is one two three four, and then y is no 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 that's row no. one two three four. Those are okay. just row numbers. Those are just row numbers. So column x would be one one two two, y is a a b and then c where z is one two three three. Yeah, and so if so we, you're yeah. um hold on a sec. I'm gonna do this real quick. What happened is this, I think. Let me make sure that I'm not I'm making up stories and actually let me simplify the code. So um, effectively what that did, A, A, B, C, one, two, three, three, yes, is that it unnests Y and then it unnests Z when you say unnest Y and Z. So if you look at your code, it's got unnest uh, One, combined two, three, Y and three. Z. Okay. And what's really happening in the code is it's unnesting twice because it unnests Y. And it, so when it unnests Y, it, like I show in the intermediate input there, it creates um, just those are all one-to-one -one because Y, or sorry, it's it's one row of um, x, uh, x is one, y is a, and then z is an integer of length two. And then it has a row with x is two, y is b, z is a double of length one. And then another row, x is two, y is c, z is a double of length one. So that's the intermediate result. And then you unnest z. And so you double out the a because you've got that one that's it. That's two values, and so you end up with this result. Did that make that's sense? Totally, that's hard to say in words. No, nope, so. <laughs> that totally makes sense. One hundred percent, that makes sense. Okay. 
All right. I have a, uh, a question. Sorry. So yep. um, I'm just trying to think of scenarios, right, where you wouldn't want it to match, for example, right? So that C in column Y to the value three in Z, why doesn't it just fill in a null or something when it doesn't have that extra, you know so, what I mean? Like placeholder. Right. Because maybe you don't want it to match in that way. Like it's supposed to match, you know, first element to first element. And then if there is nothing, it should just be a null or empty or something. Right. Um, there are ways to deal with that. And that would be deeper into tidy R. Okay. Um, a, well, a think... very useful function to know about in tidy R, which he doesn't talk about at all because it didn't exist yet, is hoist which is where you can like pull something out of a list column and say, I want this to be at the top now. I want it to be its own column. So that's why mm -hmm. it's hoist. Just like pull it up out of the list. Um, that could deal, like, I can't think on the on, uh, on my feet here to say exactly how to deal with what you're talking about. Yeah, no, no, no I, I was just wondering. Yeah. yeah. So there would be ways to do that. And I, I mean, I think what I would want to do is probably um, explicitly do like a map to and combine X or combine Y and Z in some way. And so you're having them go in one at a time. Um, something like that. That's well, not quite right. But because the problem is in your original data structure, you implied that you didn't say that row one of Y goes with row one of Z. You yeah, just, yeah. You know, so it's broken data. And whenever you have broken data, you got to do some fancy things to unbreak it. And it's got to be an explicit rule that you are setting because the data doesn't imply that rule necessarily. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, I, what, what immediately comes to mind in this thought process is really, really horrible Excel spreadsheets. So users <laughs> would populate, you know, some crazy amount of data and then mm -hmm. pass it over to us. And now we're using our studio to ingest or manipulate uh, this really horrendous Excel spreadsheet. We've got merged cells, there's nested things, or, or not nested, but uh, yeah, merged cells is really the biggest problem. So when you start to ungroup everything, what do you populate that with? Or how do you, how do you mitigate what should be there uh, yeah, to make it into yeah. that tidy model, uh, opinionated type of structure? Uh, how, would we, how would we wrangle this into something of use? Right, yeah, the, that makes sense. All right. This last section uh, is just really a, a list of different broom functions. Uh, the broom package provides three general tools for tur uh, turning models into tidy data frames. Um, I always like the naming convention of broom because it, to me, says you're sweeping up uh, or you're trying to clean up a mess uh, that somebody else has possibly made. So broom glance model returns a row of each uh, model. Each column gives a modular summary either a measure of the model quality or the complexity of, or the combination of two. If you do broom tidy model, that returns a row of each coefficient in the model. Each column gives information about the estimates of its variability. And then finally broom argument or augment, excuse me, broom augment uh, with model and data returns a row of each row in data, adding extra values like residuals and influential statistics. So that's the conclusion of chapter 25. Um, I don't know if I would give myself high marks for the <laughs> second half of my presentation, um, given the uh, vocabulary I used. I think it's uh, worthwhile to go through and look at, you know, the examples of this in the book. Broom is a very useful package still. It became kind of, it was the first member of tidy models, really. It doesn't look like it when you are learning tidy models, but um, Broom existed before all the other tidy, well, yeah, Carsnip came about after Broom. Anyway, um, and it's just a way of like, okay, now that I've got the model, let's put things back into a nice tidy data uh, tibble format. Um, yeah, so that's that's that package. And that, sorry, this 25.6 is really like, it's what the chapter is named after. Like, um, oh, we're working with many models and we're using Broom to clean that up. Uh, but in order to do that, we need list columns. And that's really what the chapter is about, is list columns. I don't know if that was in our learning objectives, John, uh, at the beginning. Uh, I don't. Remember. I may add that in there as being a, a uh, I guess, a conclusionary type a learning objective. Um, after you oh, yeah. all of this, this is the 
not not the better packages so, to do it with, but like I don't know. It is one of those things of yeah, the broom has all these things, but you're gonna like I would recommend learning them in the context of something like tidy models where you really understand it better. Um but look at the examples in the book and get, to get kind of a baseline understanding there. But yeah, you're you're right. There should be a learning objective about broom. I have no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll add one in uh, now that we're talking about it or uh, at the conclusion of the chapter, it would make sense to, to put that uh, for future cohorts if they, if they okay. do want to use this. So. All right, Lucy, what was that? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm saying I have a question. So I can use this broom package. So for example, I have, I, I did run a certain model. I'm trying to look for an example. Yes, let's say the, um, the pH, <laughs> pro pro uh, proportional hazards model. So like a statistical model. Can I still use this broom, for example, the tidy uh, function to return like coefficient uh, for a particular um, variable? Oh. Yes. It okay, needs, can, can I use that? Yeah. It, 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 broom methods need to be written for specific types of models. So if you're using like a relatively standard type of model, um, yes, broom will work. If you're using, um, you know, like a brand new model or you wrote your own function to build a certain type of model or that kind of thing, then broom's not going to work. But if you're doing an LM, or a, I mean, a lot of, lot of, lot of things. If you're doing an XG boost model, if you're doing all kinds of different things, Broom will work. But um, Broom was written to be expanded on, and it only works for models that it has been specifically written to work for. Well, uh, or models that use standard outputs actually will still work. It, we'll just go to Broom default, and it'll. Um, like it'll pull the pieces out of the model that are how to, you know, it, like, um, you know, like broom augment is really just running predict for that model for all the data that you're putting in. And so as long as your model uses the standard R syntax of predict, then it'll work. And if, if it's got um, different coefficients, it doesn't, broom doesn't care what the coefficients has or what the coefficients are, just if it has them in a standard format within the model object, then yeah, it can pull those out. So all that is to say, um, try it. And it, if it gives you an error, don't be super surprised and maybe search on the web. There might be broom methods for that model type out there in some other package, um, but it'll probably work. <laughs> Interesting, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Lucy, when you mentioned that, I, I immediately thought, as John was explaining, yardstick is the other concept, right? So yardstick is like the measurement or the quality, the expectation, is it within the parameters that you're asking it to do or not? Uh, where Broom is know, cleaning, not cleaning data, but just giving you a, a brief summary of media uh, that you're, you're providing. John, the statement yes. that made me trigger about that was, uh, or thought about that, was the statement that you're creating your own function, and if the uh, data that you're storing it in isn't matching the function that you're expecting Broom to follow, it's not going to work. Um, if you're in that tidy model concept, then the output or the storage mechanism, yes, Broom would work. Um, maybe well, I'm just supportive to, of that. Like in general, like Broom predates tidy models. So Broom works with things that you don't have to have used tidy models to create your model for Broom to work. Um, so re and really, the more I think about it, I think it does end up working for most, most models because there is a standard way of creating, like the output of a model has a standard structure to it in R. Um, I don't know, I haven't used enough weird models to know for sure how well that works, but um, yeah, in theory, it should work fine. And then yeah, I do okay. highly, highly recommend if you do a lot of modeling, um, we're gonna be starting another, I mean, there are Tidy Models book clubs running all the time, basically, and that is a very good book. So <laughs> I recommend that one if you do a lot of modeling. 
Okay, I will look into it. Thank <laughs> you. I actually do a lot of modeling. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything Can I ask else? a question? Yes, sort of just a historical question. Um, so how come this broom package came about with like specifically for modeling? Like were there not applications and just other things where you needed this type of, you know, tidy data structure? So tidy R, dplyr and tidy R are for like the general data uh, cleanup. Right. And broom is specifically for the types of artifacts that you get out of models, taking those and cleaning them up. I see. Okay. Um, I think I'm pretty sure broom was developed completely independent of the tidyverse and then kind of got folded in. Um, yeah. <laughs> Jeez, the author list on broom is huge. Um, I think David Robinson just wrote this package basically for himself and then it became mm. like the thing that everyone uses for uh, modeling one of the key things for modeling in R so um but yeah it it, it was written specifically for uh dealing with um models because model the uh, objects that models output in R um are really difficult to, to navigate. Like they're made to be usable, but not necessarily like you can print the model and right, 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 right. Yeah, coefficients, that, that's but true. pulling the yeah. coefficients out of it, it can be a pain. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so okay. that's what, what it's for. Um, and I, it's funny because before I knew about Broom, I definitely multiple times would like kind of do surgery on a model object to pull out, mm. oh, I need to know this coefficient. And that, I can see that it's in there, but it's not something easy to just pull out. And that's that's what Broom's for. Got it. Um, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. 